Well, today is the second anniversary of our Siena campus. And so I'm going to ask you, would you join me in celebrating Siena and our church family there and uh, their two-year birthday? Would you do that with me today? I want you to know that uh, Siena is strong, it's happy, it's united, it is uh, a church on the move, on the go, and we're reaching people for Christ at Siena. Our, uh, our uh, campus pastor, our interim campus pastor is Libin Abraham. Libin is a member of our team, and he has gone over to Siena to be the interim pastor there. He's doing an incredible job, as you can well imagine, and we're so proud of what God is doing at Siena. We're in a series on Sunday mornings going through the, some family values. We're identifying those values and talking about how we can build these values into our life. We're talking about seven key values that really bring health to our family, and what family doesn't want to have health? And so we've begun going through those together over these last several weeks. We've already talked about um, uh, building a sense of balance in our life, and how do we do that? Why is it so important? How do we do that so we can have time with each other and that sort of thing, building balance in our family? We've talked about a clear conscience, how to have a clear conscience with God and a clear conscience with others, and especially members of our own family, and how to maintain that clear conscience. We've been talking about responsibility and going up a few notches in that everyone doing their part, all of us have a role, and what, and how well are we doing that, taking on that responsibility and the importance of it. Last week, we talked about moral uh, fidelity and why that is so important in our family. And then this morning, I want to talk to you about the art of respect. We actually, it seems as though, sort of live in the age of disrespect. Uh, There's a lot of reasons, I suppose, for it, but it seems today that common courtesy isn't so common anymore. There is such a deep sense of disrespect toward government at all levels, toward educational institutions, religious institutions, and, and uh, uh, the law enforcement, and you name it, it seems like disrespect prevails. But if you read the Bible, you soon begin to discover that God has a great deal to say about the whole issue of respect, and it's very important to Him. He talks a great deal about the need of respect in the home, about, about respecting Uh, our parents and about uh, parents respecting each other, about respecting our children and and children respecting brothers and sisters. A great deal the Bible talks about by the whole issue of respect in the home, but not just in the home, but anywhere in our life. People that are in government and people that are in in, uh, the different uh, employment and institutions that we're a part of, people that are in authority in in our life. The Bible talks a great deal about respecting but not just even people that are in some area of authority. It talks about respecting others that we encounter, even people we don't know. In 1 Peter 2, verse 17, he says, I want you to respect every body, every person that you encounter in your life. I want you to have an attitude of respect toward them. People that believe things you don't believe in and have different opinions on different issues than you do. People from a different political party than you are a part of, or even a different religion than we are. People that are in our life wherever we encounter them. The Bible talks about treating other people respectfully. It was Jesus that gave the principle that they'll know that you are my followers if you have love for one another, and love for others. Now, I want you to think about what Jesus really taught us. We are to stand for moral principles, and we do in this church. We stand for Scripture. But He doesn't say they'll know you are my followers when you stand for moral issues. He says they'll know you're my followers when you love each other. And sometimes we forget that in the context of a family. God expects every member of the family to treat each other, every other member of that family, respectfully. It changes the way we talk to each other. 
It changes how we treat each other. It changes how we deal with different situations that we face, whether good or or not so good situations in our life. When we have an attitude of respect for each other, it changes the whole atmosphere of the family. I want to talk to you about that very issue today. Really, there's two kinds of things that I want to deal with in the whole issue of respect. One, us giving respect to others, but the other, us earning the respect from other people toward us. I want to start with the whole idea of how do we improve our respect quotient? How do we do better in expressing respect toward other people? And as I was studying this, I came across pretty much five issues that the Bible addresses about the whole idea of why and how it is that we are to demonstrate respect for each other and for others in our life. The first one is simply this, that we're to see people like God sees them. Maybe every so often, perhaps we might forget this very idea, that God sees people in a certain way and He wants us to take on His nature and thus see people the way He sees them. Look what the Bible says in Psalm chapter 8, verse 5. For you made people only a little lower than God and you crowned us with glory and honor. God doesn't see mankind, humans, as some notch above uh, the evolutionary track of a monkey. He sees us as his greatest creation. He sees us in such a way that he created us to be a little lower than even himself. Not in power, not in nature, but in the area of respect. What some people call riffraff and trash, God says, wait a minute, I made that person. I love that person. That person matters to me. I want you to treat that person as a creation for me. There's no one above us. There's no one below us. In a very real way, the ground really is level around the cross. And we're to treat each other, no matter what our situation in life is, we're to treat each other with the kind of respect that the Bible talks about God treating others as well. For instance, Jesus said, it's Jesus speaking, for God so loved the world. He didn't say just a group of people. He didn't say just Baptist. He didn't say just Americans. For God so loved the world, and that means everybody in it, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. This is God's measure of love and even respect for people in the world. Notice what he also says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. These two passages and other passages in the Bible like them expose to us God's view of people, how God sees others in the world, people in the world, how he sees us, how he sees other people. He loves every person. God sees people as people of worth so much that his son died for them just as as much as he died for you and I. And God expects from us, his children, From those who are Christ followers, he expects from us to view others the way he views them as well. I want you to notice what else Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 35, he says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you came to see me. And the righteous said to him, Lord, when, when do we ever see you in any of these conditions? Scroll down to verse 40. And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, just as you did it for the least person, you did it for me. When we demonstrate respect toward other people, no matter who they are, where where they are, how we come across them, whether they share our values or not, when we share respect 
to other people, we are demonstrating respect to Jesus. We need to see people as God sees them. It changes the whole way in which we address other people. Also, we need to view respect as an investment. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Give and it shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall others give to your lap? With what measure you measure out, it shall be measured back to you again. Now, usually we take this verse in the context of of money. When we give to other people in need, when we give to the work of God, freely God gives back to us. And that application is perfectly sound. But the application can be broader. And so I want you to think of this in a broader term. When we give out respect, respect comes back. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Doesn't mean that everybody that we give respect to, that particular individual will give respect back to us. That doesn't always happen. But in a general sense, when we give out respect, in a general sense, respect will come back to us. Sort of the whole idea of an investment. And in fact, that's what the Bible is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, when he says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. We usually think of this passage in terms of giving financially because it is its context. That's where the verse is, what the verse is talking about and where it's located. It's talking about that subject. But I want you to think about the overarching principle of what Jesus is saying and broaden the application. When we give out respect generously, it comes back in the same way. When we give it out meagerly, it comes back in the same way. If you want people to treat you graciously, if you want people to actually demonstrate respect to you, then give respect out. And when the same measure, it'll come back to you. I I remember as a young pastor, a guy just made an offhanded statement to me, and I've read it other places since then, and you probably heard it too, but he made the point, and I remembered it. He said, be careful how you treat people on the way up, because you might meet them on your way back down. It's really true. Proverbs 11 verse 17 says, you do yourself a favor when you are kind. Respect is sort of an investment that really comes back when we we give it out. The third principle that I noticed in the Word is that we should see respecting others as a way of respecting God and even ourselves. How we treat other people says more about ourselves than it says anything about them. How I treat others tells them something about my relationship with God as well. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, when he says, He who does not love does not love God, for God is love. What is he talking about here? God is saying, look, if you, if you know me, you've invited me into your life, and I've come to live inside of you. And if I've come to live inside of you, you will begin to demonstrate my nature. My nature is love. So if I truly have come to live inside of you, you will begin more and more in your life to demonstrate who I am. But if you don't, if that's not there, if, 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 you, if your life isn't really demonstrating love toward other people, there is a point in time which you've got to step back and say, wait a minute, do I really know God because I'm not really acting like him at all? He's not really being shown. His nature is not really being shown in me. People who don't love demonstrate that maybe they really don't have God living in their life. There's another statement that Jesus made that I think was very profound, and I've gone back over it a million times over my life, and you probably have too. It's found in Luke chapter 6 and begins in verse 27 all the way in a large passage to 35. And notice what he says, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. 
Look at verse 35. But love your enemies and do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. And then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Now, notice that word sons, that's the key, and, and it's, a, it's used in a generic way. It really means children. It's talking about sons and daughters. And here's the point he's making in the passage. There's two words in the Greek language that's translated children. The first word is the word technon, T-E-K-N-O-N, and it really is talking about children that are maybe in grade school or preschool, smaller kids, technon. But then there is another word that's pronounced weese. It's spelled H-O-I-S-E, but it's pronounced weese. And it is, that word means a mature son who acts like his father. That's what it actually means. In other words, it uh, it it is a child that has grown up from being a technon to a weese that is now beginning to take on the nature the maturity of his father. You know what? When you're a parent, you have, you have a little child and a little baby, and you see that baby grow up, and they get, in, get into the teenage years and, and beyond, and you're now seeing that child beginning to act so maturely, beginning to take on so much maturity that you were hoping to build into their life, and they're living it out. You get so proud. I mean, you do as a parent. I I remember as my two sons were growing up, and as I started seeing them making mature decisions and great decisions, I was so proud of them. Look at what is happening in their life. Well, now I'm a grandfather, not just a dad, but I'm a granddad. And I've got three grandchildren, and I love my grandchildren just as much as any other grandparent loves their grandchildren. My oldest grandchild is Jude, and Jude has turned six years old just a few months ago. And you know what? I see him make so many mature decisions, even at just six. And when he makes those decisions, I got to tell you, just privately in my heart, I'm just, there's just a sense of pride that just emerges in my heart. You can't help it. As a parent, as a grandparent, when you're watching children growing up and maturing, Have you ever thought that maybe God is exactly this way about us? That when God sees us, He he begins to see us growing up and maturing in our spiritual life. He begins to see our lives change. He begins to see us act like Him, taking on His character, His nature in our life. The Bible says that when we begin to love people who hate us, and we begin to act kindly toward people who are unkind toward us, and when we don't retaliate against them, but we keep acting like our Father, He says, great is your reward in heaven. Because why? Because you are acting like a mature son, daughter, just like me. You see, when we demonstrate respect for those, even those who are disrespectful, when we we demonstrate respect toward other people, we're showing how important God is to us. And we're even demonstrating respect to our own selves. There's a fourth thing that I saw in, in Scripture, and that is it talks about developing sort of the art of discretion. It's, it's not so much why we should now, but how we should, developing the art of discretion. Discretion is saying the right thing at the right time. Now, get transparent. How many of you have ever said the wrong thing at the wrong time in the room? Okay. See, I have to put like up a million hands. I'm terrible. I'm still in process of growing up, and maybe all of us are. But notice what the Bible says about this in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 23. Everyone enjoys a fitting reply. It's wonderful to say the right thing at the right time. Well, that's true. But notice what else it says in verse 28. The godly think before speaking. You know, I, I, I would have thought he would have said the wise person, but he, he goes beyond it. He says the godly person. The godly person thinks before they speak. 
But now notice what else he says. The wicked spout evil words. And maybe sometimes we're godly in this area of speech, and maybe some other times we're not so godly, maybe wicked. And God is saying, I want you to learn discretion. I want you to grow in discretion. So what is this? Well, I saw some definitions of it. First, discretion is what you thought but were wise enough not to say. Discretion is the ability to make a point without making an enemy. Discretion is changing the subject without changing your mind. Discretion is sharing kind words, gracious words to someone who needs them. You know what? This church is is fantastic about that. You're so supportive. You're so uplifting. I know to all of our staff, I, I get those those letters and emails as well. And uh, not that long ago, I got a particular letter that was from a woman uh, in, in our church, a young woman, family, and she was sort of telling the story of their family, sent a picture of her husband and her and three kids, and just telling the story of coming to Sugar Creek and the, and the difference that has happened as they've grown spiritually in this church. i got to tell you, I was... Seriously, I was at my desk, and I was reading this letter, looking at the picture and reading the letter. I, I was so moved. I took the letter home, showed it to Kathy. We read it together on the sofa. And, you know, we said, this, this is why we get up in the morning right here. This is, this is why we do what we do, and this church does what it does. And you know what? Every so often we need that, don't we? We need we need that kind of encouragement, and, and God is saying, I want you to be that kind of person. There, there is somebody that you know in your life, some family member, extended family member, some coworker, somebody that you could give a word of encouragement to. And in the midst of maybe a difficult moment, demonstrate discretion. Proverbs 15.4 puts it this way, kind words bring life But cruel words crush the spirit. So think about it in this way. How is it that I increase, I grow, I mature in in my giving out respect? We see people as God sees them. We view respect as an investment. We view respect as giving respect to God. And even in some respects, giving it to ourselves We develop the art of discretion. Here is the last one. We learn how to disagree without being disagreeable. There are a lot of wrongs to right in the world. There's a lot of things in our culture that we don't like that need to be changed, and we need to make a stand for them. And we do in this church, and we deal with those kinds of issues in our church. We don't don't hide from those. But our stands, when we make them, need to be with the Spirit of Christ. So what is that? Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 17, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. It's not always possible. But as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. And do not be overcome by evil. But overcome evil with what? With good. Overcome evil with good. In other words, don't do back to evil what evil does to you. You're only justifying in the minds of whoever it is their evil. Jesus said, I want you to totally change the way you approach this. When you are trying to overcome evil, I want you to overcome evil with good. And i got to be honest with you, that's hard. That doesn't come naturally for us. That is taking on the nature of God in our life, even at times in which we don't want to. There's a saying, you've heard it, I've 
I've heard it many times. I still can't track down exactly who created it. Maybe, maybe that's lost forever. But it's this, this phrase, our, on essentials, there must be unity. On non-essentials, there must be liberty. And on all things, there must be charity. There must be a sense of love in how we treat each other. And when we don't, when we fail, get it right. We're always going to have times in which we encounter people we don't agree with. And in the context of a family, there are going to always be times in which there's disagreement. But Jesus said it this way in John chapter 17, verse 20. My prayer is that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. What, what is he saying? I, I, I want them, Lord, I'm praying that those who are my followers will be not just unified in us, but will act like us. That the world might know that we're one. I've given them the glory that you gave to me that they might know, that they might be one as we're one. Jesus is really saying two things in the passage. He's saying, first of all, that how we treat each other says to the world who we are. They will know us by our love. It's the concept, it's the principle that he's giving. And then second of all, that non-believers are watching. And they're going to be influenced either for Christ or against Him. Not so much by what Jesus said, because they won't even know what Jesus said, but how we act. Sometimes people forget that. Not this church. I'm being honest. I really feel this way. Not this church. But when churches fight, and it's other churches, it, it's never been here that I've ever seen. But when other churches I've seen fight, I'm thinking to myself, what's wrong with you? What are you saying to everybody that is watching this? Now take that application and bring it home to your family. Lord, that every member of this family would be one just as you and I are one, they might show who we really are by how they treat each other in their home. We really do demonstrate to our neighbors, to those who know us, how valid Christianity is, at least in application, and in their minds, how invalid perhaps it is. These are the kinds of things that I believe that God wants to say to us as we learn how to mature and grow in giving out respect. But how about earning the respect back? We don't have a lot of time, but very quickly, how do we earn the respect of other people? All of us want other people to respect us. None of us wake up in the morning saying, you know, I just really hope that everyone disrespects me today. Nobody gets up and says that. Proverbs 22 verse 1 says, a good reputation is better, a better choice than riches. Respect is more valuable than money. The Bible treats the whole idea of earning respect of others to be of great importance. So how do we do it? What are the principles? Very quickly, just in bullet form, first of all, be a person of dependable Christ-like character. Proverbs 21, 21 puts it this way, the person who pursues righteousness, I'm wanting to live a righteous life. I pursue it with all, all, all the, that I have. I want to live a right kind of life. He says that a person who pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and respect. Think of the word prosperity not so much as money as it is quality of life. And he says that a person who pursues living a right kind of life and loving other people will have respect that comes back to them. So he is saying, be a person who loves others and lives a life God calls right. 
And if you do, people will respect you. Next, be a generous person of kindness. What is, notice what he says, Psalm 112, verse 9. He who gives generously to the needy and shows kindness will be powerful and respected. Be a generous person of kindness. Have you ever thought of that? That even how generous I am is demonstrating the nature of God and respect is coming back. The third one is this, be a person of humility. I had a professor in my master's degree who one day made this statement, and I hurriedly jotted it down. I've thought about it so many times. He said this, to stay balanced and humble in ministry, do this. Believe half the compliments that you get. You get a compliment, cut it in half, and half the criticisms. You get a criticism, cut it in half. He said, first of all, you're not, you're not nearly as bad as some people say you are. And you're not nearly as good as some people claim. And if you'll cut both sides in half and get somewhere in the middle, you'll keep your head on straight. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 puts it this way. For, the great, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. And that phrase, sober judgment, is just another word for humility. God is saying this to us. Look, if, if you will live a right kind of life, the way I, what I call right, if you will live righteously, you'll treat other people with kindness, and you will be generous to those in need, and, and you will be loving toward those in your life. And if, and if you will have a sense of humility about your life, people will respect you. You will earn the respect of other people. Proverbs 29 verse 23 says, arrogance will bring your downfall. But if you're humble, you'll be respected. So I'm going to ask you something today. It's just step back and you take a look at how you treat other people how you communicate to other people. Where do you need to grow? What needs to change? God is wanting you and I to be people that demonstrate respect because in so doing, we demonstrate Him. And He's also asking us to be people who earn the respect of other people. How are you doing with that? Let's pray. Father, we come to you today and we acknowledge our need all of us are in process and we're all growing, but God, we ask that your spirit would keep pushing us, that you'd keep growing that sense of respect that we give out and that we earn from other people. The truth is, Father, we cannot demonstrate your nature until we have your nature, and we cannot have your nature until we have received your Son into our life. All of us, you have said in your word, are dead spiritually dead in sins and trespasses. None of us can do what we need to do, live the way we need to live, and have the relationship with you that we desire and need to have outside of yielding ourselves to the only hope of our salvation, and that is Jesus Christ. Lord, Jesus came to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. You sent your Son out of your love for us to come to this earth and to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sin, to rise again from the grave, to offer us the gift of eternal life. And eternal life doesn't mean just life forever. It means a quality of life that begins right now. Father, I pray for those, those in this room that have never committed their heart by faith to Jesus Christ, that this would be the moment of salvation for them, that they would make the decision, I want Jesus in my life. Oh, God, may many come today and give their heart and life to Jesus Christ by faith. Father, I pray for those in this room today that are visiting this church. They know Christ as Savior. They've accepted Jesus. There's a sense in their heart, this is the place God wants me to be. I pray, Father, this morning there would be many in this room that would come in our time of invitation and come and say, I want to come and join this church and be a part of this people today. God, move in hearts. Today we come yielding ourselves to you and saying, yes, Lord, 
to however it is you're leading our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.